Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. At the end of the month of Elul and the Rosh Hashanah spirit, uh, today we want to move to a new military Jewish personality, actually two of them, a Norman Naftali Schneer and his brother Cliff. And this is the first for me because I've never worked with the Royal Canadian Air Force before. Maybe you have, but I haven't. And uh, there's going to be a lot to learn from Norman and his brother Cliff, who were in World War II. A lot of halacha and hashkafa lessons that are pertinent for Rosh Hashanah and all year round. But we want to start off with a pasuk from King David. And this is from a set of sukkim connected to a mitzvah that I think we've all done. Probably sometime in your life, you probably bench Gaimel. I hope not for something that's uh, too horrendous. And you can imagine if you're in the military and you're in the Air Force, uh, you, you're going to be benching Gaimel at some point, which uh, Mr. Schneer certainly did. He was a navigator. His son yet didn't tell me the exact rank. Just know one brother, Cliff, was a pilot, and uh, Norman, his name is Naftali, he was a navigator. I didn't get the rank yet. But uh, the psukim for benching Gaimel, of course it's based in the Torah of a carbon Torah, the thank you carbon, and there's four, four <laughs> basic categories, but the Gemara and Brachis staples it to verses in Tehillim. And the one that we're going to work on today is this one, which is associated with being in prison and being in the desert. So in chapter 107, King David says, Vayitzaku el Hashem, and they screamed out to Hashem, Batsar lehem when they had trouble, Mimsu koseyem yatsilem. And from the midst of the trouble, being in the middle of the trouble and the pain, God's going to save them. And the psukim that David over here works with describe the four basic categories, which I'll enumerate in a minute. And it indicates that there's a reason why you go through it, and then afterwards you have to thank Hashem big time for making it through. Now there are four basic categories, and they're in two different orders. Now I usually don't get excited about the order that things are in, but I know you do. So I just want to mention that <clears throat> if you look in the Code of Jewish Law, or Gemara Brachot, so over there the basic order is who has to bench Gaimel? Who thanks Hashem for miraculously making out of a tough situation? And I'm not going to get started in defining a miracle because that's a very big argument. If we bench Gaimel with Hashem's name, does it have to be a, an extraordinary miracle violating the rules of science, stretching the rules of science? There's a lot of disagreements about it. And if I start with that, I know you're going to finish me off. So I, I, I'm gonna, I'll leave that for another time. When personally you have a salvation, just answer it by Weisblum. He'll tell you what to do and what not to do. I can just tell you from my own experience, when I was 16, I got bitten by a dog on a country road, a dog that had a very, very long train that went across the whole street. Thank God it didn't have rabies. And David Cohn knows that if you're walking around the Catskill Mountains in the summer, Anything could happen, and I do know that since getting bitten by a dog, it's not exactly one of the four categories you have to decide where to fit it in. Uh, my rabbis had a huge argument if I was going to get to bench Gomel with Hashem's name, without Hashem's name, it was in the end, Rabbi Abraham Berman from YU picked up an Aruch HaSholcha and hit the other rabbi, and he said he's going to say God's name. But the four basic categories uh, are, at least the way they're listed in Shulchan Aruch and Gemar Brachas, is Yordei Hayam, those who go down to the sea. So that's Mr. Sliam. So Rabbi Weisblum will give a follow-up shear on if Mr. Sliam, on his sailing adventures, should be benching Gremel every single day. And they do talk about that, but that's between you and the, you and the rabbi. But of course, you're a professional. And they've got, you know, they've got about everybody else in the ship. But anyway, um, so people who are seagoers, Holchei Midboros, people who go through the desert, you decide what desert that is. Someone who was very sick and got healed, and the last one is somebody who was in prison. In Tehillim, David HaMelech does not do that order at all. David HaMelech's number one or two are the desert traveler and the 
prisoner makes it up to number two. So they talk about the difference of an, uh, why the, the Gemara has in one order and King David put it in another order. Very simple answers, I'll get to that. But I just want to give you some background on Mr. Schneer. So Norman Naftali Schneer was a navigator during World War II mm. and they were flying out of England <clears throat> and they were coming out thousands, thousands of planes on the family website. The family has a website that has all these details. So he said what was happening, this was a time <clears throat> when England decided it was payback time to the Germans and they were sending all over Germany, he says, thousands of Lancasters and Halifax bombers and pathfinders and Mr. Schneer was part of this. As I mentioned, his brother Cliff was a pilot. His brother, his brother will get captured and killed. Norman's going to make it out, and he describes on the website, I mean, Mr. Schneer's no longer alive, but he was around long enough to write it all up, how when you fly a sortie, even the best flying fortress that you have, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of variables that go in. Part of it is there has to be like a huge amount of airplanes coming in because you have to deal with anti-aircraft fire and you have to deal with radar. At this point already, I believe this was 1943, uh, the, the radar was going very well and you have to be part of a very, very large group that will confuse the anti-aircraft shooting that'll confuse the radar. You don't want your plane to move away from the group. And of course, the big one, you gotta get the weather forecast exactly right. You gotta get it exactly right. So what happened with Norman, and he, and he was already living in, the, in Canada then, uh, I believe his name was Naftali Ben Moshe. So he had flown many, many, many sorties, and this is how he, he says it worked. The Pathfinder aircraft would go ahead of the Halifax bomber. The Halifax bomber was a huge, huge plane. Uh, it moved slower and it was very, very susceptible because it moved slower and it would fly part of the time with the bomb bay open. So it was more susceptible. But the way Mr. Schneer tells it is the Pathfinder, let's say a Lancaster, would go out ahead and they would start dropping flares. They would drop the flares, then the Halifax bomber would come and they would drop the bombs where the flare was, and you'd do your job, get with your group, and get out of there fast. He said as time went on, it got scary and scarier, and boy, they must have davened up a storm. Because not only were you davening that the anti-aircraft uh, fire shouldn't get you, the Germans, the Germans were a lot of things. But you gentlemen know, one thing they were not. They were not stupid. Oh, no. And they figured out after a while how to fake the flares to confuse the Halifax bombers. And what would have been the name of our plane there? You told me this once before. RB-17s? Yeah, B-17s. So the Twice German... What? B-17. B-17. I'm asking you. Oh, you told me once bomber. before. Okay, that's the our equivalent to the Halifax fortresses. bomber. What? Flying Fortresses was one of the Amer big American bombers. Yeah. And that's B-17? Yeah. Where is Earl? Okay, anyway. So... in the Navy. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right, settled. But, <laughs> but what happened is the Germans figured out how to fake the flare. <laughs> The Germans figure out how to send something up that looked like a Pathfinder flare so that the Halifax bomber would drop the bomb in the wrong place and waste some bombs and do who knows what itself. Well, this is what happened. Mr. Schneer said most of the time when you're a navigator on a plane, you can't look out the window. You can't because you are, he says, you're busy nonstop figuring out where to go. What's the weather? There's a million different things you're figuring out. On this journey, the one he's going to go down on, he decides, I'm going to make some time. I want to see what happens. I'm looking out the window. So he made up with the bomb guy, I'm going to crouch on your back, and I'm going to watch the action. I'm going to get myself a few minutes. Now, he writes that they were at a disability because the weather forecast was wrong. And because the weather forecast was wrong, they had difficulty keeping the exact speed. And because they had difficulty keeping the exact speed, there was a point where their plane 
was separated enough from the group to be in danger. And he stresses over and over again, you must be with your formation at a certain height, at a certain speed, or they're going to get you. And he stresses very much, you want to jam the radar and jam the aircraft, anti-aircraft. So if you move the way, and he says some calculations were, were off, and that's what's going to do them in. So he's crouching on his friend's back, and they see, first they see one flare go up, and they're ready to fire, to drop the bombs. And then another guy in the plane says, wait a second, wait a second, five miles up, I see uh, another Pathfinder flare, let's go, wait a minute, let's go just a few minutes more and drop the bomb over there. So, you know, God has a lot of plans over there, within those few minutes that the guy said, we're going to drop the bomb over, now of course, five miles away in an airplane, how many seconds is that? 10, 20, what? We're yeah, probably running about 400 miles an hour, I guess. World War II, 1943. Yeah, more like 300. Yeah, 300 yeah, 400 miles an hour, so. 250, 300. So five miles is going to be, how long is going to take him? <laughs> so it, it, it Couple minutes. Right? <laughs> yeah, one or two minutes. Ain't gonna be too long. Yeah. Be a lot faster than you and I. Yep. So in those few minutes, they're getting ready to drop the bomb. They heard a heavy thud. Captain announces calmly, "Boys, time to bail out." So Naftali Schneer's job was because everybody has a job and they had done drills to open up the hatch and get rid of it. Because if you don't get the hatch out of the way, can't get out. you can't get out. Someone's going to get stuck with the parachutes. <laughs> so, and he just, everybody was doing it pretty well. He got rid of the hatch. He got it open. He got his parachute on. And you have to, he said on the one that they had from the Canadian Air Force, there were two clips that had to be fastened. Now, there wasn't a lot of time. Plane is going down. Things are smoking. You got to move. Um, he couldn't get the second clip to go. He figures, okay. He said something. I never dreamed anybody would say this. He says, I'm going to jump. I'll fix the other one on the way down. <laughs> now, I don't know how anyone got the presence of mind. On my way down, I'm going to fix this over here. But he said, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fix it. He gets out, and I'll have to read you the details sometime. The man was so calm, going down out of his airplane over German territory, over Berlin, and he explains how he's watching all the bombs go off all around. He goes, oh, this is what it looks like. And he was getting ready, and he, he, he started slanting. And this must have been like beyond, unless they drill you for this, unless they purposely send you down. I don't know, in parachute school, if they purposely send you down wrong, but he started slanting. And he says, oh, it's slanting because I didn't do the second clip, so it wasn't on right. So then he went for the second clip, and somehow the way the parachute moved, he just couldn't get to it. So he's going down who knows how many miles an hour, how many feet in the air, on one parachute clip to himself. Talk about believing in God, or figuring out what God wants from you. And he realized that the way the parachute was now positioned and twisted a little bit, he couldn't get to the clip. And he just made up his mind. He goes, well, you know, if it stays, it stays. If it doesn't, it doesn't. This man must have been saying Shema like a thousand times. But, but in general, he seems to have been pretty calm. And he goes down. And I won't get into all the details now, but uh, he does get taken to uh, German prisoner of, war, prisoner of war camp. Not a creation camp, not a concentration camp. He was in a holding cell for a while. Uh, he didn't. He didn't have anybody beating him up. At least, at least that I know at this point. Now it's weird. There's a wonderful rabbi named Rabbi Akiva Males. He's the rabbi of Harrisburg, PA. If you have a vacation in Harrisburg, stop in there. He's a very nice man. His brother Micha is my computer tech guy, and both of them served in the IDF. And Rabbi Akiva Males wrote uh, a big Dvar Torah on Jews and dog tags. There's a lot, a lot of Torah going back to Rabbi Ashri in the Holocaust and earlier if you're allowed to, to alter your ID so people don't know you're Jewish. 
during World War II, it was very, very common. There were some soldiers that would have the, 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 the letter for being Jewish altered, maybe changed to a different religion. There were Jews that got permission from the rabbi to have RC, and that doesn't stand for Royal Crown. Take a guess, my friends. Which religion? Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic. And they got permission from the people like Rabbi Ashri to do that. And of course, because they, they were terrified during World War II. You, even nowadays, if you're in Arab territory, you, you get captured, and it says you're Jewish. What's going to be? There were many men that altered it. Some men took the risk. Some men, as their planes went down and they got captured, they tore the dog tags off their neck and threw it away. And sometimes it gets found. The Canadian Air Force, at least then, did not put your religion on your dog tag, but yet. Even though there was nothing for Mr. Schneer, at least from looking at him, to look Jewish, he writes when he was captured, there wasn't anybody taking him, beating him up, but when he was brought in front of the first big officer, he looks at him and he says, Jude, Jude. So he was waiting, how did I know? Where's my note? What are you going to do to me? But at least not, nothing, nothing, nothing happened over there. He was quite amazed with that. I have met, there's a man in Lancaster named Mayor Migdon, way up in his 80s. He also was captured, I think, from, from the army during World War II. He also was in German POW camp, and uh, he said they found out right away he was Jewish, and he thanked God nothing was done to him. But I don't know if everybody has such a rosy story like that. You do read a lot now. I'm sure Gil knows a lot about this. When Jewish soldiers are over there in Arab territory, if they're on the wrong side, they must be absolutely terrified. And as Israeli soldiers, even more, we, uh, you know, we, we, we know about these things. So, anyway, let's give some attention to what the Torah has to say to Jews in prison. He was in, Mr. Schneer was in two, two different German POW camps. Uh, he, had what, he had what to eat, that's not perfect. And then at the end of the war, he had to go on a march which I'm sure you heard about that. As the Allies got closer, a lot of people in the camps went on these march, and he was in a, in a march, and he came, out, he came out in good condition from it. But uh, a few things about a Jew that's going to be in a prison camp, uh, God forbid. He did mention, though, that the Nazis, as rotten as they were, there was some kind of military code of honor. He, write, he writes this about the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services, all of things. He says there were certain things the Nazis did. He writes that Germany signed some kind of agreement before the war with America, which they did not sign with the Russians. So he says, therefore, in the same POW camp set up, Americans could have a, a relatively normal meal, and Russian captives would be on a starvation diet. And he writes about uh, experiences he had trying to help uh, Russian prisoners from starving to death. But he said it was weird. As nasty and amolic as the Nazis were, it just seems to be there were certain treaties they honored. Uh, and I may have made a difference what kind of officer you were, but he writes there were certain things that they were able to have. He just says whatever it was, they didn't have it as bad as the Russian prisoners did. So the first question that we have to answer is, how come in Gemara Brachas and in Shulchan Aruch, being in prison to what to thank Hashem for is number four? It's at the bottom of the list. And in Tehillim, King David puts it number two on the list. So there's no argument. So they say like this. The Meforshim, the commentaries say that the Gemara's list goes according to what was most what was most common what was most common, at least what was most common or shriach at the time when it, when it was put down in writing so as far as most common things so the most common thing was number one, people that, that had water experiences, number two was the desert experience, number three was intense illness, and the prison one wasn't very common, at least at that time, so that's why, uh, that's why it was at the end. We're not downsizing uh, prison because we had learned together, Gemara Bababasa, Gemara Megillah, you know, getting someone out of prison, prison is considered the most dangerous, uh, dangerous place, 
and we said it's called mitzvah rabba. We said if somebody donates money and says, I want to give money for a, a mitzvah rabba, you give the money not to any stuff, you give it to getting someone out of prison, but they say the reason why the list is that way with prison at the end is just, you know, it, it's just because it was the least common. In Tehillim, they explain why did King David put prison number two? Because Tehillim is an order of danger, and King David ranks making it through the desert number one, and making it out of prison number two. So that's why the order wound up being like that, and of course you can get an argument all day, different scenarios, country situations, whatever it is, but King David for posterity, he put down making it through the desert as number one, and second most dangerous was being in prison uh, to, to thank Hashem for. That is a scary thing. Everybody loves to fight about this. Everyone likes to argue about how much is God involved in my life, and where does freedom of choice go? And your favorite question, your two favorite questions, one from college and one maybe from later. Question number one of God's involvement, and the one I will not spend time on, you can talk to Bruce about it. Can God invent a rock that he can't pick up? People love to talk about that, but I don't. But number two, which we may talk about a little bit later, is if somebody tries to kill you, God forbid, and God didn't write it down on Rosh Hashanah, but their free will says, I want to kill you, and it wasn't written down that I should die then, is the bullet going to make it or not? Juicy question. I'm sure you fought with someone about it. There's a lot, a lot of tire on it. Ironically, one of the most quoted people is Rabbi Ochonan Wasserman of blessed memory, who unfortunately was murdered during the Holocaust, not in the camp. Uh, I mean, he wasn't gassed. He was, he was unfortunately, there was, uh, he, he was shot to death. The ironic part with him, and he has heavy discussion on how does freedom of choice and God's providence work if someone tries to kill you and that wasn't exactly your day. Uh, the sad thing is he almost was saved. Rabbi Wasserman was studying Torah with his son. What was he studying? Hmm. What bracha do you make when you get killed, al Kiddush Hashem? What bracha do you make as they're killing you? you imagine there's a lesson on that? And a Nazi came in with a Jew. Now, if you ever saw a picture of Rabbi Wasserman, very saintly looking fellow, I can't find a better word, holy looking fellow, I'm going to say saint with a rabbi. He was tall, powerful looking man, and when the Nazi came in and looked at Rabbi Ochana Wasserman's face, he said, forget it. I'm messing with this man. There's something about him. But there's a sick part. The Nazi didn't know what that rabbi was. There was a Jewish informant that said to the SS guy, I want my money. Arrest the rabbi. It was a Jew that put him in. Mm. Very sad. And this is the rabbi that has a detailed discussion if, if somebody tries to kill you and it wasn't written down in Rosh Hashanah, is something got funky going to happen to the bullet or not? There's a lot of Torah about it. You could fight about it for the rest of your life. But here's why I'm mentioning this. The commentaries want to know why exactly is prison so high on King David's danger list? Now you can talk about why desert is so high on the danger list also, but that's a whole history geographical lesson. And they're very interested in how come King David puts the ocean voyage and the being sick to be less dangerous. So they say like this, and there's what the quibble about this, but this you'll see how it all comes together now. They say, if you're sick, if you're a person who takes care of yourself, and you're in good health, and you get really, really sick, that's mostly in God's hands. 
I mean, you want good doctors and nurses and things like that, but there comes a point where a person realizes, I'm really, really sick, I don't know why, I took care of myself, I'm gluten-free, I'm going to exercise and do everything I'm supposed to do, but there's a point very often with sickness where a person feels, you know, this is in God's hands, the doctors can do what they want, I hope they do, but it's in God's hands. The ocean voyage, I don't know the whole deal, David have to give a share by that, why the ocean voyage, the sea voyage, is uh, considered more in God's hands than other things. Is there anything you want to say about that offhand? Well, like just one thing is that is any boat that you're in is always in a state of sinking. And, but you're a yeah. professional. As soon as the boat's in the water, it's starting to sink. You're a professional. So you gotta, Why are you whatever, saying this to us? So whatever you can do, you're always trying to keep the boat from sinking. So yes, it's sinking. That's why they invented those. That's right. <laughs> David, but when you wear the blue suit, you always look so confident. You haven't seen me on a boat now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should just know... You just Rabbi have to be Fe very vigilant when you're on a boat at all times. You should just know, Rabbi Feinstein says exactly what you just said. <laughs> now, I don't know how many times Rabbi Feinstein was in a boat all of the time he came here from Russia, from Strabin, but uh, Rabbi Feinstein speaks about that concept. Because he says a car is dangerous as it is, a car is on a road. Boats and planes, they're... Yeah, they're either falling out of the sky or sinking. <laughs> right. So the commentaries speak out that one of the reasons... Now, last time we spoke uh, about a Rashi and a Masha, the reason why prison is so high on the list is such a mitzvah to get people out, because it's a filthy, dirty place where anything can happen, you're open to disease, and your health can deteriorate very, very quickly. But the commentaries say that prison is very high on David's danger list because in the prison you are more, or at least you appear to be more in the hands of man. And they explain, and these opinions hold, that if the bullet is aimed at a person, and even if it wasn't a destiny day, they say God will let their person's free will kill you because they're going with the opinions that God very rarely will interfere in free will and they say being in prison is so dangerous because most of what happens to you you're open to the whims of people the warden the guards the other prisoners you are just bobbing around in the free will of all kinds of wild and crazy people so commentaries say and this is again this is going with the opinion that God very, very rarely will interfere on free will because of all the reasons free will is considered a gift and the way to run the world. It'll take a lot for God to interfere. So they say that being in the prison is very high in the thank you, God, I made a through list because most of what happens to you is in the hands of man's free will and that's really, really, really dangerous. And absolutely anything can happen. Just an aside, in Oceanside, New York, anybody ever been there? In Oceanside, New York, there's a beautiful shul called Young Israel of Oceanside. <clears throat> and the rabbi there is a marvelous 80-year-old uh, rabbi, Rabbi Benjamin Blech, who also says Shira Yeshiva University. Brilliant, brilliant man. And Rabbi, a lot of you, you may have seen his svarim, and Rabbi Blech gives a lecture on this point, and he says, I want to remind you something. <laughs> if you get doomed, by the free will of man, and God lets the free will of man do all kinds of heinous things to you, he brings many, many proof that there'll be a point where you can look up to the Lord and say, Hashem, I know you could have done something about this, but you're really into this free will thing, and sometimes you break it, but most of the time you don't, but you know I didn't really deserve this, so God, I hope later, you're saving something really good for me, aren't you, up there? You, I, I know you, you, you're going to even this out, God, aren't you? So I'm not doing justice, but my Blech has a whole sheer on explaining that when God lets these things happen, lets free will run wild and do terrible, terrible things, he goes and explains how, you know, you, you are, have a quote-unquote entitlement that God, you know, can even it out for you later in all kinds of ways. 
But if you want, I'll give you a blank state. You have to hear what he, what he says. But going back to Mr. Schneer, so he is in what Dovin and Malach says, extreme danger, is really going to thank Hashem for every day, going to bench game a big time when he gets out of there. Then, of course, you can ask a halacha question. If the Nazis take you out of one POW camp on the way to the other, do you bench game on the middle? Uh, but, but whatever, he's subject to the whims and everything of Nazis and SS people. Uh, one thing's a little bit scary. There's a plus and a minus. You may know this. Mr. Schneer said he noticed that the prison guards of the Nazis weren't quite as swift as the guys fighting out front. So he figured out that the Nazis, now I don't know if the American system works this way, you got to tell us, is that normal, Gil, that if a guy isn't such a good soldier, he's not that smart, they'll make you be a prison guard instead of being in the front? Is that a common thing? Yeah. So it works for or against you. He says sometimes the prison guards, at least where he was, you could get away with things because they weren't that smart. And he says sometimes, thank God, they were able to get away with things. But on the other hand, you know, when you're dealing with a guy that's not that smart, sometimes you can fool him. But sometimes, you know, since he's not that smart, he could like do something really terrible to you. And Mr. Schneer had to live through all this, and he was just very, very thankful to make it out. But I, I want to end today with uh, a question that may, have, uh, that, that may have come across your mind. And by the way, uh, I just want to give the exact date. Mr. Schneer was shot down on August 31st, 9-1, 1943. And he tells as he was coming down to the ground and the land was jumping up at him. Now, I don't know anything about this. Gil, you did parachuting. So he described as you're coming down, it looks like the ground is jumping up at you. Is it? Uh, it's kind of like a slow thing, so you don't... It seems like it's coming to you, but it's kind of like a slow fall. Oh, oh okay, because he, he, he said as he was doing that, he was able to pull out his watch, and he saw midnight. So right at midnight, this man is coming down and doesn't know, uh, you know, what's gonna what's gonna be with him, especially since he lost his brother. So here's the question: When a Jew is in prison camp, do you skip the bracha of Shaloh Asani Oved? I'm not a slave, because because even if you're in POW camp, which isn't as bad as I'm not belittling a as concentration camp. Well, you are going to be a slave. There's no question you are going to be a slave. So do you make the bracha of Shaloh Asani Avel or not? Because you are a slave. So this is an old, old question. Doesn't it get to you? Every time you think you have a new question that's going to break all the rabbis' heads and make all the Gemaras explode, you come up with the question, they say, that's a great question. Somebody asked that 850 years ago. But it's okay. It's okay. One time we should have a talk. The microwave almost was a new question. Almost. And if you speak to halachic experts, they'll tell you LED lights on Shabbos. That's almost a new question. But I'm not familiar with that. You can find wherever I more about that. Or, I'm just mentioning it because my Harus in Baltimore. My Harus, what? I agree it should be questioned. My Harus is Scott entered Shabbos and his wife, who's a wonderful person, forgot to take the food out before Shabbos and everything was on in the oven, with the oven on, with the LED lights and the whole business and uh, they had to quickly figure out what they could do and what they couldn't do and thank God I have an old-fashioned range, it cooks it doesn't wink at me, it's not a Star Wars creature, but one of these days Mrs. Karp and I are going to have to deal with it but it is an old question. So if you look in the Siddur, Oitzer Hatzvila, he says something that will blow you away, and uh, you may want to get hold of your local rabbi or local Chabad man to talk about it. The Oitzer Hatzvila says, Shaloh Asani Ovid doesn't mean I am free, I am not free. Nothing to do with it. So especially if you have a day when you feel henpecked by your wife, 
Notice I'm taking my glasses off because I know there's at least two people in here that are handpacked besides me. So I'm not looking at you. But anyway, <laughs> if you have a day when you're handpacked by your wife and you say, gee whiz, Shaloh Asani of it, I'm not a slave. <laughs> oh, she left me 25 texts and messages when I pulled this phone out of my pocket. Well, that's not to do with that. Daisa Tfila says there are different kinds of souls. There are different kinds of souls. There's Jewish souls, there's non-Jewish souls, and within Jewish, there's different kind of souls. There's, there's souls that are freer and less free. And he says, when you're making that bracha, you're saying, thank God that mm. I have a free Jewish soul, which connects me to a certain list of mitzvahs. Now, this is very, very complicated. It's Kabbalistic. If you're into learning Tanya, so, I mean, both your rabbi and, uh, what's the, what's the Chabad fellow's name? Rabbi Light. If you grab either one of them, they can spend some time with you explaining to you. It's in the first chapter of Tanya, explaining the different kinds of souls that there are. So the Oitzer Atzvilas says that the bracha Shalom Asani of it, it doesn't make a difference what I'm doing or what's being done to me. It's a bracha that I have a certain kind of Jewish soul, it's called a free Jewish soul, connected to 613 mitzvahs. There's another soul called an Evid soul that doesn't have that. Alright, but that's a, that's a long, long thing. Very politically incorrect. When the first Lubavitcher Rebbe was arrested, now you do know on the 19th of Kislev, Lubavitchers, get, they, they party. They party big time. They party big time. They ain't saying no tachanan. And that was the day when the first Lubavitcher Rebbe to Balatanya, Roshnei Azamim from Liadi, he's friends with you, right? You didn't, yeah. you didn't go to college, got uh, That's when he got out of prison. And when he was in prison, the Russian interrogators, this, they, they asked him about things he wrote in Natanya. And they got to that chapter, what he wrote about different kind of souls. So the first three questions they asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he answered them sharply. They didn't question him. When they got to question number four, they said, Rabbi, you wrote there different kind of souls while like, you're Jewish, we're not Jewish, different kind of souls. Well, what did you mean with all that? Because he, he writes some things in there that are poli very politically incorrect. So they asked the first Lubavitcher Rebbe about it. And again, this is Lubavitcher Rebbe. Have you ever seen a picture of him with those scary eyes? With Russian interrogators. So you can make the movie any way you want, wherever you want to start. They asked the Rebbe, you know, Rabbi, what'd you write all that for? So the Chassidim say, the Lubavitcher Rebbe looked at them with those big, beautiful eyes, and he just smiled. A very, very big smile. The Russian interrogators are looking into the rabbi's big, scary eyes, and he's smiling at them. So the interrogators just said, okay, Chana Shom. See ya. <laughs> they just didn't want to mess with him. For some reason, the rabbi said, I'm not going to mess with him. Uh, but that's, that, that's one way uh, of answering why we do say Shlomo Asani Ovid. Now from the concentration camps, this is what happened. The scene, the ghetto in Kovno. The Jews were slaves to the Germans. They were being worked to the bone night and day without rest. They were starving. They were not paid. And the Germans were aiming for total annihilation. There was a chazan there named Rav Avram Yosef, and every single day when he got to the bracha in the ghetto of Shiloh Asani Oved, he would stop and he would scream out, How am I going to make this bracha? I am not a free man. I'm a hungry slave, abused and demeaned. How am I going to say this bracha that it shouldn't be a joke? And it went on until it got to the point where he asked Rabbi Ashri, Rabbi, should I just stop saying the bracha? There's no point. It's like making fun of Hashem. It's saying a, it's saying a, a fallacy. I know you're not supposed to skip parts of davening, but it's just not true. Should I stop saying it? So Rabbi Ashri, who was also in the Kovna Ghetto, said again from early commentators, he says, the bracha shlow asani oved is not about physical liberty, it's about spiritual liberty. Your soul is still your soul. Your soul has abilities to react and soar, and that the Nazis, there's nothing they could do about that. So despite the physical captivity, we are obligated, he's actually, he is now you're even more obligated. Why? Make the bracha and show our enemies you can't enslave our soul. Make the bracha. 
So this would have meant that Mr. Schneer and anyone like him, they would have said Shaloh Asani of it, no matter what kind of day they were given over there in the German camp. But uh, we look forward to learning more about Norman Schneer and his brother, who did experience some miracles. Thank um, you very much for having me Just one small item. It could be two. Uh, for, for once, we have to give credit to the Nazis. When you mentioned uh, that uh, uh, they were uh, uh, not giving uh, just do, worse than dog food to the Russian prisoners, right. it was not because it, it is they uh, wanted it this way. It was Stalin that never signed the Geneva Treaty. It was the other way around. Yes, yes, uh, because for, for reasons either he thought he will never need it, or he said Russian soldiers do not need it. He spoke in their name. Since they had that fact already, they said, we do not need to spend the money. He never signed the treaty. So they fed them nothing, dog food. Uh, but the Americans and the other uh, allied uh, forces did sign the Geneva Treaty a while before, so they were fed a decent food. In that case, the Nazis were always correct. They, nice. Yes, that was right. the real reason. Mr. Schneer tells yes. about a man that was begging him for food, yeah. and the man showed Mr. Schneer, he took his finger, mm -hmm. he pressed it, and his bone was becoming like yes. soft already because yes. he was eating like, like this and he was yes. begging mm -hmm. Mr. Sh Mr. Schneer yeah. for the Red Cross packages. Because mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. the Russian soldiers got Russ No, packages. never. No, no, so, right. Yeah. So the, the Russian soldier was begging Mr. Mm -hmm. Schneer, mm -hmm. the, the Canadian, is there anything from your mm -hmm. Red Cross package you could give me? Yeah. And he wanted to trade him. There's an incredible mm -hmm. story. Yeah. The, the, this poor Russian soldier from his bed, from his um, bedstead, he had carved chess pieces, mm, yeah. and he little ch and he wanted to trade an American mm. or Canadian his little chess pieces mm. to give me anything. In the end, what happened mm. is Mr. Schneer gave him a salt packet. The Russian fellow was was overjoyed. He says, "I trade you the chess piece." I'm going to tell this. Still on? Hmm? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it, I'll have to talk more about that. But basically, he missed the Schneer the Colonel of Rafa. He gave the Russian soldier who was so, it, it, Mr. Schneer said the Russian soldier pulled up his pants leg, pushed against his shin, and Mr. Schneer watched the bone sink and then come out. So he was trying to show him how he's undernourished, so Mr. Schneer got a Red Cross packet, took out a salt packet, gave it to the Russian soldier, the Russian soldier gave him the little chess pieces, he took the, the packet of salt and he just swallowed the whole thing because he was so sodium deficient. And Mr. Schneer writes, he held on to those chess pieces and brought them back to remember the poor starving man that he didn't even know if he made it through. Wow. But thank you for, thank you for, for, for telling us that. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. I think there's more to eat. Shko.